Welcome to the School of Social Work. My name is Emiko Tajima, and I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the School of Social Work. We could not be more delighted to host this public lecture with Dr. Adil Haider to launch the Injury-Related Health Equity Across the Lifespan, or IHEAL, program here at the UW. The program goal of achieving injury-related health equity via workforce training, research, community engagement, and collaboration aligns so well with the School of Social Work's Innovation to Impact vision. At the School of Social Work, we aim for our Innovation to Impact vision to inform and drive everything we do, from research and teaching to public service and community engagement. Armed with data and science and the expertise that comes with decades of social innovation, we're using technology, breakthrough findings, and surprising partnerships to redefine how social work can lift up vulnerable populations living at the intersection of inequality and poverty. The School of Social Work is excited to be a partner in iHeal, and we are thrilled to support the work of our faculty member, Dr. Megan Moore, as she leads this new program. On behalf of the School of Social Work and Dean O'Hara, we welcome you, Dr. Haider. Your groundbreaking work in injury disparities and your passion for improving the lives of vulnerable patients makes you the ideal person to launch this effort. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Thaisa Wei, Executive Council Member for the UW Population Health Initiative, Vice Chair of the Faculty Senate, Professor of Landscape Architecture, and Director of Urban at UW. Thaisa. I have to say I'm really impressed it's sunny outside. So we do take it as our excitement for Dr. Hadir. My name is Thais Away, and as noted, I'm an executive council member, and today uh, with a hat on for the UW Population Health Initiative, as well as vice chair of Faculty Senate, and I want to welcome you here on behalf of both of those. Last year, I met Dr. Monica Vavilala, the director of the Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center, and Dr. Megan Moore, right from here at School of Social Work to hear about their plans for a new program with the Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center to do something that I think UW excels at, which is to bring together multidisciplinary researchers, medical providers, and community stakeholders to address disparities in injury prevention and health care. Their goal is to leverage and expand existing collaborations towards measurable, large-scale, and sustained impact. I was excited to hear about this work and particularly excited in my role with the UW Population Health Initiative because it fits so well into President Kelsey's vision. This is a university-wide initiative literally across all 21 units on all three campuses, bringing together a remarkable breadth and depth of research, teaching, and service to address the most persistent challenges in human health. We partner with local, national, and global communities to create a world where everyone, every single one, can live a healthier and more fulfilling life. We aim to improve human health and well-being through the lens of physical and mental health, as well as through the impacts of environmental health, economic and social equity, and community resilience. Incredibly important work today in the 21st century. We're excited to be a part of sponsoring this event and to join others in making this evening possible. We look forward to seeing the success of the iHeal program result in better prevention of injuries in disenfranchised communities and in positive changes in the lives and trajectories of individuals who suffer injury and trauma. And we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Hadir to UW and look forward to continued collaboration. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Monica Valihala up here to introduce him. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> welcome to um, this exciting public symposium. Um, my name is Monica Valihala and I'm the director of the Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center. Uh, which is really thrilled to be co-sponsoring this event. So you may be wondering, I'm an anesthesiologist at Harborview Medical Center, why would an anesthesiologist be interested in this topic of health equity after injury? To answer this question and to sort of set the tone for Dr. Heider's talk and for us to start thinking about this topic more broadly, I'm going to start with a story. It was 12 p.m. Sunday afternoon. It was a busy operating room at our trauma center, trauma cases left over from the night before, a list of procedures requiring us to assist with sedation or general anesthesia when the phone rang. 
it was David from the primary service, asking for assistance with overseeing sedation for a procedure. He shared with me on the phone that Mr. O, a 75-year-old Cambodian patient who was admitted with altered mental status, suspected of having some complication or the other, had been rather uncooperative with the procedure the last two nights when the procedure was attempted. So could we please help calm him down? At 6 p.m., the recovery room was full of patients recovering from other procedures. Mr. O, a small-framed, frail, and bald gentleman, lay supine on the hospital stretcher, covered with a plain white hospital blanket over his chest and abdomen. Barely visible, a saffron shawl peeped out from under his shoulders. The nurse asked me if she could give him some medication. David assembled his procedural tray and the nurse continued to ask a series of questions. Should I give him some Versed? Should I give him some propofol? Should I hook up the monitors? Should I access the peripheral IV? Can we get started? After all, David was getting rather impatient. No, stop, I replied, feeling rather pressured to move forward and unable to prevent the naturally and rapidly occurring chain of events that I really felt were premature. I was trying to think about his being elderly, not wanting to give him too much stuff that might cause more confusion, but the questions kept coming, the flow of events kept moving, and I really had trouble slowing down. Then the interpreter arrived. I had worked with this particular interpreter many times. We learned that Mr. O was in fact oriented to person, place, and circumstance. So what was the issue, I wondered, standing at the foot of the bed? Over the next five minutes and unnoticed by anyone, in fact, Mr. O had moved himself into the fetal position for his procedure, giving us permission to continue. Confused, I thought not. But he won't hold still, they said. So can you just give him something? Scratching my head, I thought, well, that's kind of odd. You aren't Buddhist, are you? Joked David. I said, well, can we just leave him alone and see what happens? I responded, acutely aware that my approach to Mr. O appeared to the others rather unnecessary, and in fact, maybe even inappropriate. As I leaned over to comfort him for the upcoming needle in the back, suddenly the interpreter's hand stopped me. You know, he's a monk, right? And you really shouldn't be touching him, you know, he said. Monks don't like that, queried the soft-spoken interpreter with brows slightly furrowed, not happy with me. In fact, Buddhist monks are forbidden to be touched or by a woman or to accept anything from a hand of one. And if a woman has to give anything to a monk, she must first pass it to a man or put it on the plate being provided. So after the procedure, <clears throat> I asked Mr. O to tell us the details of the attempted and failed procedures yesterday. It was true, in fact. All his healthcare providers during the last two days had been women. No wonder he didn't want to cooperate. He said he tried to tell them not to touch him, but they thought he was crazy. Who knows, maybe he was confused, maybe there was no interpreter, or maybe the right questions weren't asked. So although I had managed to not <coughs> breach those boundaries, it was unclear to me how many people had done so. And today, he almost received unnecessary uh, sedation for a procedure. So we did what we needed to do, and all through the procedure, Mr. O dozed off. In fact, he slept all the way back to his room with amazement, the, uh, with amazement, the interpreter said, well, you're bringing the food tray. You know monks don't eat, eat after 10 AM. And I thought, wow, I messed up again. So as an Asian Indian immigrant with maybe some cultural similarities, perhaps it's that background that stopped me from moving further, but not completely. Even I did not make the connection that the saffron shawl that was visible had signified something more special. In the rush of it all, I had leaned over a bit too much, a bit too fast, and made him uncomfortable. Had it not been for the interpreter, I would have violated some very important boundaries. So children, elderly, and patients with limited English proficiency are all vulnerable populations. What must he have felt? How easy would it have been for us to just proceed? How many violations have occurred? Did he get to eat or drink the day before? Or was his tray of lunch just delivered at noon like everybody else's? Did he, he got his food, but not at the right time. So I share this as an example of the power of language and communication, what vulnerable patients would do without them, that and cultural awareness. 
So as an anesthesiologist who spends much of her time doing, it was important reminder that many times it's better to not. On to the next case. So in this case, we were able to understand and meet the needs, needs of this patient, but this doesn't always happen and that's why we're here today. So at the University of Washington's Harborview Medical Center and at the Injury Prevention and Research Center, we work together to identify disparities in injury prevention and healthcare in areas such as traumatic brain injury, care of the injured patient, safe and active transport, and violence prevention here at home and abroad. This work focuses on improving communication, care transitions, capacity building, and culturally relevant engagement for our most vulnerable patient populations. We want to expand this work and more formally increase innovations in this area through this particular program, the IHEAL program, which brings together all of us from different schools across the University of Washington. We're particularly interested in increasing injury-related health equity and decreasing disparities from historically oppressed or marginalized groups, those with comorbid behavioral conditions, those with limited English proficiency, and those with financial or social barriers to healthcare access. I'm very excited to announce that Dr. Megan Moore, who's assistant professor in the School of Social Work, will lead the IHEAL efforts at the Injury Center. With that, I'd like to just take a few minutes and introduce Dr. Adil Haider, who is our guest this evening. Um, we're thrilled to have him here, and um, he'll be here with us for a couple of days. He's an active trauma and critical care surgeon, a prolific researcher and the Kessler Director for the Center for Surgery and Public Health, which is a joint initiative of the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also the Deputy Editor of JAMA Surgery and holds numerous leadership positions, including President-Elect of the Association for Academic Surgery. So why is he here today? He's here because he's credited really with uncovering racial disparities after traumatic injury and establishing this field of trauma disparities research. He's regarded as one of the foremost experts on healthcare inequities in the United States, with projects focused on describing and mitigating unequal outcomes based on sex, race, sexual orientation, ethnicity, age, and socioeconomic status. <clears throat> He's mentored more than 80 research trainees, published more than 200 peer-reviewed papers, and currently serves as the PI on extramural grants worth $7 million. Dr. Heider believes that equality is the cornerstone of medicine, and it is for this reason that he has been invited today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Idol Heider. Thank you very much. What a great story. That was great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, and uh, good evening, everybody. I um, uh, am so excited to be here and really honored. Uh, but before I begin, uh, how many students are here? Can you raise your hand? Thank you so much for being here. I hear that, uh, yeah, there you go. I hear that uh, uh, it's a big tribute to the importance of this topic uh, that so many of you are here given the beautiful sunshine outside. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for having me. Now, when I first got an email from uh, Dr. Moore about coming here, uh, it was a really big deal for me. You heard the wonderful introduction, but honestly, the pleasure is all mine uh, for a a uh, trauma surgeon to, you know, and be it, I'm from Boston, the Harvard system, to, to come to Seattle, to Harborview, uh, which is the ultimate best trauma system in the entire world, for sure. Uh, it's really like, for a trauma surgeon, it's really, really like going to the Holy Land, so I'm really, really excited to be here. <laughs> um, and of course, Ron Meyer, who, who runs the whole program, is here, and uh, I don't know if everybody knows this, but he's also the president of the American Surgical Association, which is the biggest honor probably that a surgeon can ever have, so I'm super excited to be here. And then the Harborview Injury Prevention Center uh, really is one of the first, if not the first, injury prevention center in the United States, and uh, many of the work that, uh, like I started out as a research assistant, I remember reading those articles and uh, talking to Charlie Mock when he used to work, you know, when he was a deputy person in charge, uh, so it's a really big deal for me to get to come and talk to, to all of you. I'm also excited by the concept of having this joint uh, program where, and I'll just be sure to get, give credit to everybody, the uh, School of Medicine, the Injury Prevention Center, the Population Health Initiative, the uh, Institute for Translational Health Sciences, and of course the School of Social Work where we are. This kind of innovation is key 
to really making a difference. And I'll tell you that perhaps the most important people who I've ever learned from in trauma and how to take care of patients after they got injured uh, were really social workers because they really make sure patients are back to their functional uh, recovery and ensure that patients really get to their full potential. So uh, just a round of applause for social workers uh, before we do anything else. Now, now as mentioned, I, I, um, I truly believe that <clears throat> equality is the cornerstone of medicine. And if any of you do tweet, does anybody tweet here, by the way? Come on, you could, so you could tweet that if you feel like it. Uh, uh, I know it doesn't say equity, Monica, but we'll, I, I know you were telling me that you know you got to get equity before you get to equality, so this is the second step of what you've uh, talked about. But I think it's very important, and uh, you know, uh, as Monica was mentioning, you know, I too am the son of uh, uh, Asian immigrants, and when you're in the United States and you live overseas and you come back and forth, you realize uh, how much potential we have to create a really equal society where everybody has the chance uh, to prosper and do the best that they can based on uh, not their station in life or who they were born to, but on their, on their ability. And what you just talked about with the um, uh, monk, I think, was just so, so important because um, that's what we need to think about when we take care of patients. We need to take care of patients as an individual um, that has hopes and desires and, and needs, and we need to take care of them in the way they want to be taken care of. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about numbers today, and unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about uh, you know, individual folks a lot. Uh, but as you look at those large numbers that we do talk about, please think of that monk and think of individual patients that you have taken care of or you've been part of to really, you know, not, don't look at 400,000, look at the, each and every person that those numbers, those 400,000s uh, may represent. Now, um, we know there are health care disparities. Who, who, who thinks that there are health care disparities in America? Right? Okay, good. So I guess we're on the, we're, I'm in the right place, I guess. Um, now, uh, many people still believe that emergency departments are the great equalizers. In fact, have many of you heard about a congressman from the western part of the country uh, who said that you know, nobody dies because of lack of health insurance because they can just go to the emergency department, right? Who heard that story? I see, okay. I see somebody raising their eyebrows. You're pretty un unhappy about it. Um, but you know, people really did uh, feel this. In fact, uh, just about 10, 12 years ago, uh, the first study that showed that there are disparities in emergency department outcomes, because, you know, we don't check insurance, right? We don't, I mean, the idea is that you could just walk in or an ambulance will bring you to the emergency department. So how could there ever be any disparities? And even though there are no obvious disparities in access to accessing the emergency department, at least, you know, no obvious ones uh, when there is an emergency department, some places like the south side of Chicago don't have too many emergency departments, right? Um, but when there are uh, the places available, uh, you, people think you can get right in. But the first data to show uh, that there are disparities was amongst little children. And the idea was that kids who were, uh, you know, fell off a swing or were taken to a suburban ER, you know, they got a larger workup than inner city children who um, also had a head injury but really were just given a pat on the back and sent out, right? Well, the suburban kids will get a lot more workup, a lot more observation, and so on. So for our first study, and this was back when I was a, uh, a trauma fellow, so Dr. Meyer, this was in 2006 or so. Um, this is the first study we did, and we wanted to identify disparities in clinical or functional outcomes between children of different races. And for this study, what we did is we looked at the, at that time, the National Pediatric Trauma Registry, the NPTR, and we analyzed about 4,700 white children with severe head injury, about 1,000 similarly injured black children, and about another 1,000 similarly injured Hispanic children. So these are severely injured kids, severely injured, uh, head injured kids. And um, this is what we found. We found that there was no difference in mortality. But there was a difference in the kids' ability to uh, walk, their ability to talk, and their ability to eat uh, after discharge. So you know, people were very surprised that uh, you know, there were these disparities in outcomes after uh, injury amongst little children. And uh, you know, uh, what I'm going to try to sketch today, this story, is how one of these first outcome studies then led to, led to uh, us now working on national uh, policy. This paper was uh, published. It received, actually, a, received an award. You'll see me there in, in a picture where I, I look much younger. Uh, that's a long time ago. Uh, so um, you probably can't recognize me. That's why I have to point myself out. Um, <laughs> uh, but but you, know, uh, you know, people seem to, at least we thought people seemed to like it. But turns out that that wasn't universally true. 
Some people really didn't like the fact that we had studied healthcare disparities. In fact, and I know you're recording this, so I'll, I'll try to uh, temper what actually happened. Um, but the first time we presented this work, it was at the uh, AAST, the American Association for Surgery of Trauma. And uh, let me just set the scene. This is in a hotel room in New Orleans. It's 2006, right after Katrina. So this is the first major, one, well, the first or second major conference after uh, Hurricane Katrina. And the person speaking just before me was the Surgeon General, right? So the room was full, not because of me, but because of the Surgeon General, okay? And here I go, and I'm a uh, you know, trauma fellow, and I present my paper for 10 minutes, and I talk about these healthcare disparities. And there are four questions allowed, and I answered the four questions. Uh, and the last question was, well, what do you think this, what, what may be causing this, and so on? And I gave some sort of, yeah, healthcare, you know, disparities, bias. I talk about unconscious bias or something like that. I'm not entirely sure exactly what I said. But whatever I said caused a very severe reaction in that somebody from the back of the room started screaming, bullshit, bullshit, you can't get away with this. Now remember, this is the most prestigious trauma conference in the world, right? And this person is screaming from the back of the room, and so I look at the moderator, and it's L.D. Britt, and he's looking at me, and he's like, what have you done? <laughs> and then this guy just comes up to the front of the podium and starts screaming at me. He's like, you know, you're, you're talking about healthcare disparities. You're insulting people who take care of my minority patients. How dare you do this? You're actually causing harm by studying disparities, right? So I did what any person would do in my situation. I was on the podium. I, like, jumped off the podium. <laughs> and, and I jumped off the podium, and I uh, tried to calm him down. I'm like, no, but we use this kind of statistical modeling. To our, you know, here I'm talking about numbers to this guy. He didn't want to hear any of it. Um, but at that point in time, and this is where mentors come in. So uh, this is where this guy, Eddie Cornwell, walked up to the podium. So this guy, I got to tell you the story. So this guy's, I'm standing here. He's screaming at me still. 600 people are watching me. Um, uh, uh, Ron Pauline, who's a good friend of mine, my wife was there. We had just gotten married. She wanted to see what a talk looks like. <laughs> we have, she's never come to another talk ever. Uh, and, and then so Eddie Cornwell comes up to me while this guy's screaming at me and comes up to me and puts his arm around me and just walks me away. <laughs> just walks me away. And this guy's like, what? You're not going to let him talk to you? You're not going to let me talk to him? And Eddie is this like basketball player guy. He like doesn't wear glasses. So he looked at him and gave him this like death stare and said, if you talk to my fellow like that, you're just not worth talking to, right? Um, now, this is what people did publish in the Journal of Trauma and, and, and so, our, uh, you know, we, were, we understood the gravity of, of talking about healthcare disparity, especially in a situation where people felt like they were doing the best possible job. Remember, trauma surgery, surgeons, ED docs, you know, they take care of vulnerable patients. And so for them to see that, you know, their healthcare disparities, it, it took a little bit. You can imagine that, right? Our real response was that we wanted to use the best state-of-the-art methodology so that we could really, really uh, seek the truth. And, um, we brought together uh, pioneers in the fields of uh, quality and safety, uh, epidemiology and biostatistics, uh, and healthcare disparities, for example, so social work and um, uh, social psychology, so that we could really understand you know, why these uh, disparities occur. One thing that came from this was that you know, when we did that study with the kids, we didn't really look at socioeconomic status. It was just straight you know, black, white, Hispanic. So what do we do about socioeconomic status? And many people, at least at that point in time, thought, well, how about looking at insurance or controlling for insurance as a potential surrogate for socioeconomic status? Now, many people in the room are here who, I'm, who I agree with that it is, it's insurance status is not the best uh, indicator of socioeconomic status, but it does tell you more than just the ability to pay a bill. There is something that you can correlate with it. So for our next study, what we looked at, we looked at the odds of mortality after trauma and we looked at the National uh, Trauma Data Bank. And this data now is about almost 10 years old. But what we did is, is that we compared a white patient who has um, uh, an injury. These are, again, severely injured patients, not just head injury. These are all kinds of injuries, an injury severity score 9 and above. And compared that to a similarly injured black patient and found that that patient was about 20% increased odds of death. And then compared that patient uh, to a Hispanic patient. and Compared to the white insured patient, the similarly insured Hispanic patient has about 50% increased odds of death. 
Now, what about insured versus uninsured? So we compared a white uninsured, white insured, I'm sorry, to a white uninsured patient and found that, again, about 50% increased odds of death just because they, the association here was just that they didn't have insurance. And if you d happen to be a minority, you'll see that that increases even more. There's an additive effect that it's about 80% for a black uninsured patient compared to a similarly injured white insured patient. Now, when this data uh, did come out, we, we did get a lot more support this time. People were like, you know, this is a big problem. And uh, what we were able to do was to put together what we called, at the time, the National Disparities Working Group. And this brought together um, uh, authors from many different universities um, across the country. And, you know, we set out to do joint projects together. One of the projects that we did uh, was this meta-analysis. And this uh, meta-analysis, uh, you know, looks at all these different authors you'll see here, and you'll notice that at the end of it still, about a 20% increase odds of death after major trauma just by being black, right? So now we're thinking this data is really, 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 really strong. And so the next thing we thought, well, what are we gonna do? And um, we decided that we'll use a public health problem solving approach and it's a very simple approach, right? The first thing is to identify the problem and create some awareness. The next thing is to understand mechanisms that lead to the issue. And then the third thing is just create solutions and disseminate them, right? Sounds pretty simple, right? I'm glad you agree that it's pretty simple, okay? Uh, so talking about identifying the problem and creating awareness, uh, we did a survey. And uh, we surveyed about 546 uh, fellows of the American College of Surgeons. So these are fully qualified surgeons. And we first asked them what they thought about the evidence for surgical disparities, disparities in surgery. Now, this is beyond trauma. This is disparities like cardiac surgery, black patients are 30% more likely to die. Breast cancer reconstructions, black women uh, or in Hispanic women much, more less, much less likely to get reconstructions. All those kinds of disparities across the surgical field. And turns out that 50% of the surgeons who we surveyed these are all practicing surgeons, thought that the data on disparities is very weak. Meanwhile, there are tons and tons of data on disparities. Even those who believe that the disparities are strong, a quarter of them thought that there are no disparities in their hospital or clinic. And 90% of them thought that there are no disparities in their personal practice. So yeah, there are some disparities, but certainly not with, with what I do, right? And probably I thought the most striking piece of this data was that 90% believed that the patients were the cause for the disparities. Not the doctors, but the patients, right? And so if you bring this back to the story we just heard about the monk, you know, it's, in that story you heard loud and clear that if something went wrong, whose fault was it, right? Are we going to blame the uncooperative patient, or are we going to blame ourselves for not knowing what would have worked for that patient? Right? And that's where we are uh, kind of today. Now, um, understanding the mechanisms that lead to these disparities, I am very, very privileged to have the opportunity to work with a, a large group that was devoted to this and remains devoted to it. And we um, uh, you know, serially studied uh, host factors, uh, pre-hospital factors, uh, hospital and provider factors, including things like unconscious bias um, and other issues that may have something to do with uh, healthcare disparities, um, and of course post-hospital care and rehabilitation. We, we, we did a lot of work on each of these uh, areas so that we can uh, figure out ways to improve outcomes. And today I'm just going to talk a little bit about the hospital uh, factors instead of talking about uh, um, a whole bunch of things. Now. Um, just to give a shout out here, uh, this was a, a lot of work and, you know, I'm just one person and uh, you kindly credited me with creating the field of trauma disparities and uh, uh, that's certainly not true because it's really the trainees who do all the work. Uh, these are so, just a, uh, some of the fellows and you'll notice the things that they did. Each one of them has come up with a brilliant methodology advancement in health services research that enabled all of the work uh, that we've done. For example, Nabil Zuffer, uh, there in the nice tuxedo, I think this is from his like residency prom or something like that. Um, 
but what he was able to do is figure out the best way to predict trauma mortality using just six variables and was able to get a, get a receiver operating characteristic of about 96%, so really good. Uh, Tolu Uyotunji, who's a pediatric surgeon in Kansas now, um, you know, he did work on how to deal with missing data. Uh, Zan Hashmi helped us understand how to use, how to look at trauma centers that don't have a very high volume and use some Bayesian methods to adjust for that. Uh, um, uh, uh, we've been doing a lot more qualitative work now. Lisa Kodatik, one of our residents, has been doing great stuff on that. Caitlin Hicks, we wanted to, work, you know, a lot of our work has only been on younger patients, 65 and below, and she figured out how we would do risk adjustment for comorbidities amongst older patients, because the re reason why we couldn't study older patients was lack of risk adjustment for comorbidities for trauma patients. So each one of these fellows um, uh, really contributed to the methods that we employed. Now, um, Really, is it the patient or the trauma center when you look at these healthcare disparities? And to answer that question, uh, we looked at the National Trauma Data Bank. Uh, the National Trauma Data Bank is uh, uh, managed by the American College of Surgeons. Uh, all the verified uh, level one and most of the level two trauma centers in the United States contribute data to the NTDB, including Harborview. Uh, and there are about 900 hospitals in there uh, at this time. And, uh, we first just looked at crude mortality in three different sets of hospitals. So the first set, set of hospital, and I apologize, this is actually flipped. It should have been less than 25% minority patients. So these are predominantly white hospitals. So just think of these as predominantly white. These are mixed 25 to 50% minority hospitals and greater than 50% 50, 50 minority hospitals. Uh, you'll see that the crude mortality just keeps going up and up and up. Now that's crude mortality, and you may say, okay, well maybe these hospitals here, the ones that take care of a lot of minority patients, they may have sicker patients and so on, so okay, fine, uh, their crude mortality is higher. So when you do some risk adjustment, you find that, uh, okay, uh, this is not um, uh, uh, the case, that uh, hospitals with greater than 75% patients are here, 75% uh, white patients, so mostly white hospitals, and compare them with uh, hospitals that are more than 50% black or Hispanic, and you'll see that uh, their odds of mortality at those hospitals are greater than about one-third, increased by about one-third. Now, when we first published this work, uh, you know, people were like, well, you didn't use the exact technique that trauma centers use to benchmark one another, all right? And so now I'm gonna get into some wonky math here for just a moment, but let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, all trauma centers in the country, you know, they're benchmarked uh, by this thing called observed to expected uh, ratios. And what you do is, is that you use, you remember that, that adjustment model that I was talking about? You use those kind of adjustment models to figure out how many people should die at your trauma center based on the severity of injuries you have. So for example, Harborview Trauma Center, uh, Dr. Meyer, how many traumas do you see over there? 6,000. 6,000, 6, right? So they have 6,000 uh, patients and maybe based on the severity of injury, they have you know, 200 deaths per year or 300 deaths per year. Now all of a sudden, that's what they are expected to have. All of a sudden, if they had 500 deaths per year, what do you think is going on? Something's not working, right? So their observe to expected death ratio goes up, right? And that's what this O to E ratio is, and that's how most trauma centers in the country are, are benchmarked. So people said to us, well, you didn't use that kind of benchmarking, so I said, okay, We'll redo this whole study and we'll use this kind of benchmarking. And when you uh, do that, you then plot all the trauma centers that are in there on a kind of graph like this, this butterfly curve. Have, have people seen that? Did we do a lot of this in quality uh, and risk adjustment? Who's, who's seen something like this before? Right, just a few, right? So that's why I'm taking time to explain this a little bit. Um, and you'll see that these are the trauma centers that you want to be, right? You want to be a low mortality trauma center, the one that has, if you had 300 expected deaths, one that's having 200 expected, right? It's less than what you're expected. And over here are the high mortality trauma centers, trauma centers that are having too many deaths, right? That's what we're looking at. And so just here, let me depict this a little better. Um, these are the low mortality ones. Again, this is where you wanna be. These are the high mortality ones, deaths where you don't wanna be, okay? And so then what we did is we plotted on this all the trauma centers that took care of most of the minority patients, right? Most of the black and Hispanic patients where do you think they'll fall? What do you think? You're right. I don't have anything for you, but you're right. <laughs> um, and that is that, yeah, almost all of the trauma centers that take care of a lot of minority patients fall over here, right? Now, 
there are some trauma centers that take care of a lot of minority patients, and they fall over, fall over here, right? And when you really think about it and look at them more carefully, we find that these very famous safety net uh, training centers like Grady Memorial Hospital or Shock Trauma in Baltimore, um, uh, you know, they fall over here. They do a fantastic job. But there are a lot of hospitals that work under dire circumstances, taking care of a lot of patients with penetrating injury, a lot of patients who don't have insurance. They don't have the ability to really um, invest in uh, quality improvement and so on. And those hospitals take care of a great proportion of minority patients. And that's certainly one reason why you ha end up having disparities in, disparities in outcomes after trauma. Now, another thing we wanted to do was to see what happens to you if uh, you are black, white, or Hispanic and went to one of these trauma centers. And so we looked at the adjusted odds of death based on your race or ethnicity uh, at the trauma centers. And we found that if you go to a good trauma center, it doesn't make a difference if you're white, black, or Hispanic. Whoever you are, if you go to the good trauma centers, your odds of death goes down. Right? So it doesn't make a difference within the trauma center. It makes a difference really um, between the trauma centers. And so this is kind of what we concluded. Uh, and I'll let you decide if you thought it's the patient or the trauma center. What did you think? What do you think? Go ahead, what? Well, I'm glad that you're so easy to convince. <laughs> uh, but this is just one example of uh, numerous different studies that have led to kind of building this whole uh, field. And we've done some work on specifically looking at patients. And uh, I'll talk about this uh, at the Grand Rounds on, in, in, at the University of Washington on Wednesday. But we've also looked at um, uh, unconscious bias. And I know I'm only bringing this up because you mentioned that, uh, to see if unconscious bias makes a difference for healthcare uh, outcomes for trauma patients. And, Turns out that whereas there is a lot of literature in the medicine world that it does make a difference, uh, in the surgery world, which is very um, you know, uh, routine and there are a lot of protocols and a lot of things we follow, it seems like unconscious bias, although present, just as much as everybody else, it seems that it, uh, its impact is a little bit lower. And um, I'm hoping that I can get through this talk with uh, at least half an hour to spare for us to have a little bit of discussion. And certainly, we can discuss uh, more about that. I see some heads nodding that, you know, how is that possible? I know Dr. Sabin is right here. She's going to be like, what is he talking about? Um, but anyway, so now um, getting on to creating some solutions and then uh, disseminating them. I think the biggest thing that happened with uh, um, this uh, part is the creation of the Committee on Healthcare Disparities from the American College of Surgeons. Now, what, what we've learned from this is that you need to have some sort of like effector or chain a change agent which takes the responsibility to go and make a difference, right? And a previous president of the American College of Surgeons, Dr. L.D. Britt, um, you know, when he, he was the president of the college, and after he stopped being the president, you know, he really committed to creating this committee on healthcare disparities. And the biggest thing I think the committee did is to commit the American College of Surgeons, which is the biggest and oldest body of surgeons, towards saying that healthcare disparities is a problem. Remember, previously people didn't think it was even an issue and also make that statement that optimal access is the key to quality of care, right? This was a sea change for the college because the college initially was, uh, you know, talking a lot about quality and so on, but really access wasn't uh, really on its radar. And so now saying that, you know, we need to make sure everybody has access to good health care uh, was a really important thing. And the college's response to changes to the Affordable Health Care Act and so on are all kind of in that direction and it's really great to see uh, where this group, big group of surgeons, there are 80, 90,000 uh, you know, surgeons in that group, uh, you know, what they're thinking about. Uh, the college also started devoting some resources. This is, uh, you can go to their uh, webpage and uh, search for healthcare disparities in surgery, and it will give you um, uh, a synopsis on almost every single publication that uh, has been published in the field. And uh, uh, you know, it's been really helpful in kind of spurring the movement to study healthcare disparities in surgery. And all those uh, literature reviews are um, based on this theme which was developed with the NIH. And um, you know, it puts surgical disparities into five specific things. Uh, patient factors, post-op care and rehab, provider factors, 
clinical care and quality, and then systemic and access issues. Now the next step that happened after we created all this is, is kind of akin to what you're seeing here today, that we brought a whole bunch of people to figure out how we're going to solve a problem and make a difference. And a similar event occurred uh, almost two years ago at the NIH with the American College of Surgeons, and this was the creation of the National Research Action Plan for Surgical Disparities Research. And it was a symposium held on the NIH campus. It was supported by um, the ACS as far as money goes. Uh, and the goals of the conference were first to develop a national agenda for surgical disparities research and then produce a list of priorities to assist the National Institute of Minority Health and Disparities, the NIMHD, um, and other funding partners to figure out how we're going to fund uh, surgical disparities research. And that prioritization list um, has then recently been published in uh, JAMA Surgery, and it's um, all available online. To give you a little bit of an example of how this actually worked, here I have a short video that uh, I'd like to show. My name is Edward Cornwell. I'm Beth Sutton. My name is Lisa Newman. My name is Henri Ford. My name is Ramana Hasnain Winia. I'm uh, Michael Zinner. I'm Stephen Stain. I'm David Hoyt. I'm the executive director of the American College of Surgeons. We have a multi trillion dollar uh, industry. No, there's no other multi trillion dollar industry in, in America. But we have the greatest healthcare disparities of any industrialized country. That's unacceptable. Before in the literature, had always, we, had, we, we always thought that it was mostly in the medical field, but never really thought that uh, in, in surgery this would um, be an issue. Uh, and so it was a no-brainer for me to be you know, interested in a collaboration to explore further um, surgical disparities in, in outcomes. Over the last two days, we spent many, many hours trying to determine what are the most important issues that need to be studied to mitigate surgical disparities. And I'm very proud uh, to say that I think we were very successful in doing this. We started uh, in the morning on May 7th. We worked all day long, came up with nearly four or five hundred different research questions that could be studied across five different teams. And this work was done by about 50 of the most preeminent surgeons and scientists from around the country. And they were aided by a army of staff, research assistants, uh, and research fellows who helped get all of this process done. Those uh, research ideas, they were all collated overnight. And the next day, there was great lively debate about what's the top thing to study uh, and how to prioritize things. And the group did a great job, and they stayed on task. They prioritized things top one, two, three, four, five uh, for each of the different teams. And we now, I think, have a very formidable research agenda that both the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute of Minority Health and Disparity and the American College of Surgeons will be very proud of. Now, of course, it takes a very modest surgeon to show a video of himself talking <laughs> while he's talking. So somebody asked me if I, if I'm, if I still operate, and uh, uh, I guess that proves that, right? So, uh, but this is what that led to. And uh, just as this is an example of what, what can be done. I mean, you gotta, keep, you gotta keep going after it. But after the agenda was published, uh, the NIMHD then last year um, in the fall published this uh, request for proposals in which they asked for uh, you know, proposals for surgical disparities research uh, really committing millions of dollars to uh, study this problem and come up with solutions. Uh, and I'll tell you for, I know there's some major leaders in the room, you know, uh, the leadership at the NIMHD underwent a change, right? So we did all this work and then the uh, director changed. But the great thing about our institutions uh, in general are that they have memory and if you do things with the, you know, they take a little bit of time, but if you do things with a whole bunch of folks, you know, they were already pretty committed to this. So the new director who had a great vision, I believe, his name is Alicio Perez Estebal, he did a new uh, reframing thing and uh, came up with the top three things that the NMHD would do. And unbelievably, to many people's surprise, he picked surgery, or their group, their advisory council, picked surgical disparities as one of the major things they're gonna study. So having all this done in a very systematic ma 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 matter, I think was very important for even the new leadership to say, okay, this is important, 
we're going to do this. And, and they, um, uh, their funding announcement, uh, you know, this is what it talks about, uh, uh, has really spurred a great amount of momentum now. Um, from what I understand, I'm not part of the study section, obviously, because I'm myself applying for grants. Uh, but from what I understand, there are at least 35 R01 applications that were submitted. That, can you imagine what it takes to submit across the country about 30, 35 R01 applications? I mean, that means that there are that many high-level investigators really focused on surgical disparities research. And more importantly, it has brought in many people who are from are all sorts of disciplines. I know one of my primary care colleagues, you know, because they interact with surgeons, has submitted a grant. I mean, it's across the spectrum. So from the School of Social Work, and I know this is a grant of a whole bunch of people here, please look at this. Um, uh, you know, request for funding proposals uh, and try to submit something. I know I'm creating more competition for myself, uh, but that's the whole point of this. Now, uh, one of the, this bolded here thing, one of the thing, and I just put these slides in there so they're a little bit more d data, there's more text than usual on them, uh, but one of the grants that we just got reviewed and have gotten a good score on is um, regarding this concept here about creating uh, new surgical quality indicators. And um, you know, the reason for that is that quality improvement has seen many, many successes in surgery. And the way we do quality improvement is really the backbone of that is quality measurement. You know, you need to be able to understand the quality, like for example, you're doing some sort of surgery. Uh, I'll ask one of the students, pick any surgery. Where's the student? You, are you a student? You look pretty young, so you may be, yeah. <laughs> cardiac surgery, right? So what we look at in cardiac surgery is like, 30-day mortality, right? 30-day outcomes. Now, I did not plant him, just so everybody knows. Um, but uh, we look at 30-day mortality outcomes, and that's one of the quality indicators. Now, um, the idea is that if it's high and you monitor it, you can do a quality intervent an intervention and then improve the quality and decrease that. Suppose 5% of your people were dying 30 days after surgery. You want to do some interventions to ensure that it's now dropped down to 3% and then 2% and then hopefully almost no percent, right? Uh, so quality measurement really is the linchpin by which uh, quality improvement uh, occurs. And whereas there's been a lot of improvement in quality, unfortunately there are still many, many, many disparities uh, in uh, healthcare quality. And all those improvements have not translated to improvements across the board for everybody. So minority patients uh, and vulnerable patients still have much worse quality outcomes than than others, and there's a whole role uh, for uh, quality improvement uh, to, to uh, decrease uh, healthcare disparities. But a major barrier uh, has been a lack of standard quality indicators and metrics used to consistently measure surgical disparities, right? So I know this, again, is a lot about numbers, but unless we're able to really track and see how much disparity, how the disparities are, we're never really gonna be able to fix them. So, um, we just got this work. Um, uh, hopefully, it, it will go through council and get funded. And what it is is, is that we're going to try to build um, uh, quality measures for disparities across the uh, continuum of surgical care. So we're hoping to look at access, to look at quality measures for access to surgery. And I'll give you an example. Uh, where I used to work in Baltimore, it's a famous hospital. Um, you know, prostate surgery there is a big deal. And a lot of famous men come to get their uh, prostate surgery there. They come from around the country. Uh, they come from the US Senate many times. Um, but they're older men who come for prostate surgery from around the country. Uh, but the patients who live around that hospital, they have virtually zero access into that hospital, right? Because it's tough to get in that hospital, trying to get an appointment's difficult, and so on. So they go to a, another hospital down the street, which has much worse outcomes consistently, because it's just easier to go there, more friendlier to go there. So we want to look at access to care. And then the five phases of surgical care, which are Pretty obvious, preoperative care, perioperative care, intraoperative care, postoperative care, and then post-discharge. Uh, and what we're using is uh, the National Quality Forum has this uh, thing called the disparity-sensitive criteria. So what they can do is they can apply, and I'm going to just rush through this so we have more time to talk about it, but they can apply this kind of a, a hierarchy uh, to understand if any disparities metric that's out there, like, for you said, 30-day mortality, like 30-day mortality, if that is uh, disparity sensitive um, or not. And uh, um, we apply to each measure uh, this rubric and can come up if they have a certain number of points, you know, um, there's a, a quality gap or not. Now, 
there are currently no well-known ways uh, to do this, and so our proposal is the first attempt to compile a standardized suite of disparities, sensitive quality metrics across the continuum of care, and it uh, brings with them uh, some specific innovations. The first innovation, we at least think, is that it will approach surgical quality from the five plus one phases of care that I've just mentioned. It's gonna incorporate access and measurement of disparities. It's gonna use standard benchmarking techniques, as I mentioned before. You know, us surgeons, we get all upset if things are not the typical benchmarking way we usually do them. And then um, it's going to use ACS NISQIP data, or the National uh, um, Surgical Quality Improvement Program data, so people are very used to that. And then uh, to really build all these metrics, we're gonna use a, a specific Delphi uh, process. And um, our aims for this grant is first to develop a, a conceptual framework to identify preliminary metrics, evaluate these preliminary metrics, and then determine the feasibility of these metrics. And I'll um, just give you an example of how this DSM criteria is applied. And I know you talked about um, coronary bypass, you know, cardiac surgery, and this is an example. That's a, uh, the measure there is use of internal memory artery uh, in coronary artery bypass grafting. So that's, uh, you know, the bypass procedure. And the IMA is, is a superior way to do it. Uh, and so, you know, if it turns out that we apply this metric and minority patients somehow are not getting this versus other patients getting this, then you could, then it is sensitive in picking up disparities. Does that make sense to people? And so that's the whole idea that, that we would apply these disparity sensitive pet metrics. And you'll see, I just, as I just mentioned, you have to have nine points to be disparity sensitive. And this one has 12 points. So you can see that this previously used measure, it's available right now, it's in this script, uh, can help us determine if there are disparities at that center, right? And so that's what the kind of work that we're, we're doing. And, and the way we plan to do this is first, you know, do an environmental scan uh, and then adapt these uh, disparity sensitive metric, the criteria that we showed. You know, we need to really adapt it for surgery. So we need to do some Delphi work to do that. Um, and then we are planning to uh, apply the DSM metrics to like all the DSM criteria to all the known metrics and then come up with what we think are a good suite of measures, use a Delphi process to really determine that, and then um, uh, apply those measures on real world data uh, and see what we come up with. And then use that to then choose, finally, disparity sensitive metrics. So that's the kind of work where we're, we're going. And I show this today and this talk about uh, impacting, imp impacting national policy, because this is where we think um, the future will be, that um, uh, creation of these kind of metrics eventually, we hope, will be a way by which hospitals are able to see how they're doing themselves as far as disparities go. And then hopefully that each hospital, if they're able to decrease the disparities that each hospital is, is contributing to, then hopefully we'll be able to then decrease disparities in a whole. Oh, 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 and, and that's kind of our hope. Now, um, uh, just to, in the end, I want to just end on a, a positive note. Uh, and this is what I think we can uh, do together. Um, I think we can uh, do great research and create interventions that are effective and evidence-based. And I think the IHEAL conference, I think, is going to come up with some great interventions and ideas. I think we can create metrics and accountability frameworks that track this for each state around the country. Uh, and then we can decrease disparities across the country. And then um, that, I hope, will continue this work on creation of a National Surgical Disparities Eradication Program under the auspices of the ACS, and that's what I hope that we'll eventually, eventually get to. So from all of us at the Center for Surgery and Public Health, uh, this is our group. We put kids to work all the time. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much for having me today. an hour for questions. Um, if uh, Please feel free to um, engage us in a conversation. Right. So uh, please raise your hands and think Tyson. Um, so I'm not very familiar with this, so feel free to tell me that you offer. Yeah, we'll wait for the microphone. Oh. So feel free to tell me, you'll explain it later. But I'm curious in looking at the trauma centers how, um, and the disparities, how much of it is about facilities and how much of it is about training or background of the medical staff, sort of how much of it, or, or is it a combination of the two? If it's not unconscious bias, if it's not pre-existing. Right, so, you know, the facilities uh, 
uh, one would expect if they're verified to be very, very good, right? That, that, that should be a level player feed because you know, the American College of Surgeons and other state entities goes and verifies and checks each of these trauma centers. They make sure you have the same amount of surgeons. They make sure you are able to respond in time and so on. The thing we need to learn uh, from those trauma centers that do a great job uh, compared to the trauma centers that don't do a good job it is why, right? And there's some great work by this uh, person out of Baltimore, Daryl Gaskin, and he's shown that uh, safety net hospitals that have exactly the same amount of staff, exactly the same amount of doctor, nurse ratio, and so on, they, con they consistently have much worse outcomes, right? And what is it? Is it uh, the way the processes work? Is it the lack of ability to invest in quality improvement? Is it the manpower and staff? You know, what is it that leads to some hospitals doing worse than others? And that's where I think we need to focus on. I think we need to use qualitative human factor engineering and other methods to figure out, you know, why there's a difference between certain hospitals and try to make interventions to, to raise them all up. Okay. I think you have a response. No. Okay. Oh, you didn't have a response? <laughs> but it would be nice to get your... Uh, yourself, Ron Mayer, Chief of Surgery, Harvard U. Lovely man. Been here forever. <laughs> yes, been here forever. And thank you for recognizing we're the best trauma center in the world, because we are. <laughs> and we even fit on the curve appropriately <laughs> to fit that definition. But no, it's, it, it's a great talk, and, and it's a great, I congratulate you on your great success at converting the discussion away from where it was to where it should be from the NIH standpoint on down. I mean, that's a phenomenal success story. Um, I, I, I have two things. One is the comment you just made is everybody has to pass a test to become a doctor. You have to pass a test to become a level one trauma center or to be a cardiac center. And, I mean, no, they're not equal, as you just followed up with, is passing minimal standards does nothing to assure high quality. And from a medical standpoint, as you say, being able to find the things that cause some performers to be much better than others, even though objective counts are the same, is, is a whole field of teamwork, um, dealing with uh, communication with the institution, their commitment, and so forth. And, and that whole field has been looked at, but it's very hard to crack that nut, like you said, to float all boats up at the same time. But what I would ask is, we all have implicit bias. And I, it's interesting that your data supports that if you do work well, that the implicit bias goes away. And so two parts of that. One is, um, should we stop talking about uh, minorities as a problem and every time you break them up into black, Hispanic, white, you're reinforcing that old concept. And it's not because they're a minority or, dis or a group that has inherent disparity. It's the lack of access to the same quality of care. And so by continually breaking up the analysis that way is, is, is a bit, to me, counterproductive because it's not whether you're black or white, it's do you have access to the same high quality care? And, and that's where the focus should be going forward, is dealing with the doctors, the institutions, and make them of equal comparability so that everyone has the access. Because as you show, if they do have access, their mortality is the same as the white group. So, to me, I, I think it's time to get out of that rut also. And the second part of the question is, or for you to respond to, is being given that you can show with highly protocolized care in a high quality institution, you overcome the, you imply that you overcome implicit bias that we all carry with us. And so can that be extrapolated more broadly as a 
approach or conceptual approach to dealing with implicit bias in the workforce, promotion in the academic center, pay grade, the entire challenge that we have in academics is it the same principle and can by protocolizing transparency by those approaches have a big impact on what sometimes is unrecognized, unintended, implicit bias and eliminate it. So, um, and this is the great thing about uh, our field that it's great, it, we're able to have, and that's why I wanted to have more time to, to have a discussion about this. Uh, I'll start by saying about, you know, coming from the patient standpoint. Uh, we have a paper that just came out. Uh, it's regarding this thing called the Equality Study. And the Equality Study uh, is a uh, funded by PCORI study to uh, develop a patient-centered way to ask patients about their sexual orientation and gender identity. And so what this does is, is that it uh, did uh, qualitative interviewing of folks and asked them about, uh, is it okay to ask you about your sexual orientation and gender identity? And uh, you know, when you come to the emergency department, I'm sorry, I need to add that. And the reason why we did this study is because a, a friend of mine who happened to be gay explained, was talking to me and telling me that you know, when he goes to the hospital, he's, if he goes to his primary care person, you know, his primary care person like, knows who he is and he feels very comfortable going to them, but if they go to the emergency department and don't know their doctor, uh, it's very uncomfortable. They're not sure if they should say what to say and so on. And so we did this study, we did these qualitative interviews, and then we followed it up with uh, a survey of about 1,000 patients, right? Uh, 200 nurses and 200 doctors, and asked them about should we collect sexual orientation to generate identity information? And uh, who's gonna hazard a guess on what we found? What do you think? You're shaking your head there, what do you think? My guess would be that they don't wanna know because they have to do something about it. The doctors don't wanna know. Okay, what about the patients? So what, what do you think the patients th thought? Anybody over here? What do you think? What do you think the patients thought? Yeah? They want to check it off on a form, right? Saves them a conversation. Saves them a conversation. You're absolutely right. Because when we ask sexual orientation questions about do you do drugs, do you do smoke, if we put it in the, in the, in the social history part, do you do drugs, do you drink alcohol, what's your sexual orientation? It like makes it seem like it's a bad thing. But if you normalize it, that you ask it from everybody and you can actually just check it on a form, it makes it very noticeable. Patients feel that they are counted and important because of that. And 90% of patients, this is unbelievable. We got lots of press, New York Times picked it up, there's a whole thing coming out about it. 90% of patients said that they want to be counted just like you said over there, and 80% of doctors thought that patients will not want to know, that we shouldn't be asking patients. 80% of doctors and nurses. So our perception of what uh, patients want and how they want to be perceived and counted is very, very important. And whereas we don't show mortality differences, uh, we are seeing uh, severe differences in long-term outcomes now, and I haven't showed that data, but we're seeing very severe differences in long-term outcomes uh, for minority patients. And that's where the whole piece of social work comes in. So if you look at the data on how people rehab, and luckily because of systems that um, uh, folks like, in, you know, and Harborview is, in, is one of the leaders in this, you know, mortality from trauma has dropped. You know, even for severe injury, it's less than 2% right now, right? And so what it is, it's long-term outcomes that people have, and, and that's where we need to focus on um, I think uh, going forward. And just very quickly on your unconscious bias, this is where I think it makes a difference. We've done several studies looking at unconscious bias and in the medical world we found, uh, or other people found, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Green, found that unconscious biases that we have, so let me just explain what I'm talking about. There's a, a test that was helped, partly developed here at the University of Wa Washington by Tony Greenwald and it's called the Implicit Association Test. And you can use that test and you can determine if you have a preference towards one thing versus the other. It's a computer-based test, and you could do it for Republican versus Democrat, and that's a really fun one to do. I highly recommend you trying that. Um, or you could do it black versus white. And for people who happen to have a preference towards white, by the way, a million Americans have taken that test, 
one million and 70% of us preferred whites, right? And in that test, if you take a look and in the medical world, it's noted that patients who, or doctors who had a preference towards whites or bias against blacks, they treated patients differently in the primary care setting. Very good data to suggest this. In our trauma world, we did this on medical students, we did this on surgical residents, we did this on nurses, we did this on surgeons. We tested this on about 900 folks. We even got 200 fully board sort of, double board certified surgeons to take the IAT. Can you imagine having surgeons do that? Can you imagine? By the way, we gave them $200 Amazon.com gift cards to make them do it. That's how it worked. Um, and we didn't see the same approach. We saw that they had the same unconscious preferences, but it didn't impact. But my hunch is that it doesn't impact in the immediate protocolized care. And where it works um, is that when patients go out, not just access to care, but maybe it's, and Dr. Greenwald actually explained this to me really well here at University of Washington, uh, that maybe it's this intra-group preference that people who you're able to relate to better, people who you know easily, people who have more contacts in the healthcare system, you're able to take care of them easier, they're able to navigate better, they're more, quote, resilient, which we talk in trauma care. But a lot of minority patients and vulnerable patients, um, you know, they end up having uh, a lot more uh, challenges to recover from their injury. And that's where we, we need to go. So I still think that unconscious bias and implicit preferences play a role, especially in the long-term care, when you need to really get to know the patients and develop uh, you know, care plans that work for them. And if we try to work the care plan like we had with the monk, uh, if we are gonna bring the guy dinner or lunch at 12 o'clock, it's just not gonna work, right? And that's where the, I think unconscious preferences will, will make a big difference. Sorry for the long-winded answer there, but yeah, we need to get your opinion on this because oh, maybe you should introduce yourself a little bit as you, yeah. uh, okay, all right. <laughs> all right, I'm Janice Sabin, and um, I'm in the School of Medicine, and I've done work on unconscious bias. Um, but my question was different. My question is, if you develop quality measures, are trauma centers going to welcome this and you know have an open mind and be sort of in this improvement mode? Are they already? And will they sort of uptake this? And then the second part of it is, what do they do about it if they are poor quality? I mean, will there be interventions in place for them? You know, I think the, um, the big thing here, is, so the question is, you know, how are we going to make this <coughs> change uh, sustainable and have people embrace it? I think the way to do that, uh, of course, first, it's coming from a respected organization. The grant's not by me. It's actually the American College of Surgeons grant, and it's going to be led by the previous president of the American College of Surgeons, Dr. Britt. So he's going to be one of the people helping to run the Delphi pr program and trying to bring all these stakeholders together. So there's a very large stakeholder advisory board that's going to work to create these metrics. And so it may take a little bit longer. Instead of doing it in six months, we're going to do it over a couple of years. But I think it's Im imperative to get all those stakeholders together in the room use a Delphi consensus process to really come up with metrics that people can agree upon. And then the college can use its might to then enforce it along with the, so the other partner is the National Quality Forum, which creates the clearinghouse for these. And so once you create these metrics, and then you eventually uh, you know, tie them to, nowadays we're all about value-based care, and surgeons are worried about value-based care. Surgeons are worried about you know, this, their quality metrics, and they get paid based on how their quality metrics are. I'm sure surgeons would prefer having built those quality metrics themselves versus them being enforced from other, other places. So that's why I think there's a lot of opportunity because the surgeons are gonna build them in concert with uh, other experts. Yeah. Thank you, um, Monica Vavilala. So I just wanna uh, uh, go back to Thaisa, your question about where, what's the source of this these disparities and address the uh, practitioner perspective. So there was a recent article in um, Academic Medicine talking about how little training health science students receive in disparities. Okay, how little um, training medical students and residents received in approaching patients 
who are from vulnerable populations. And my question to you, Adil, is being you know, on the faculty in the School of Medicine, if you were to recommend creation of a curriculum, let's say, let's just imagine that we were gonna try to address this from a different perspective, not the payer perspective or the quality metrics perspective, but the education perspective, and this might be relevant for, you know, Janet, your or Taisa, I mean, all of us who are in health education, what would that curriculum look like and what would be the elements in that curriculum? Thank you for uh, uh, that question. So uh, we have done a little bit of work on this uh, topic and we are working on creating this thing called the uh, Provider Awareness and Cultural Dexterity Training to or Toolkit for Surgeons and we call it PACS. And uh, I'm gonna talk a lot more about it on uh, Wednesday morning at the um, gra surgery grand rounds. Uh, but what it is is that we did qualitative interviews of surgical residents and asked them about encounters like you just described where there's um, a dichotomy between themselves and their race and ethnicity and culture and the patient that they're taking care of. By the way, this, what's called, this is known as racial discordance between patient and provider. This is very extreme. If you happen to be a minority patient, 97% uh, of the time, you will see a provider who does not look like you. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon, it's about 99% of the time. So racial discordance is very, very real. And so we need to teach people how to have the best possible outcome for cross-cultural care because that's the key for patient-centeredness. And we've, we've um, really learned this. And so we asked the surgical residents and the patients through qualitative interviews about what they thought is important to learn. And they identified four specific things, at least in, the, in surgery, where they needed to learn more. First, they, needed, they wanted to know a lot about unconscious bias and this whole idea of what it means if your patient looks different to you and how do you build a relationship with a patient that's based on mutual trust and respect. How do you develop empathy? There's ways to do this. You don't have to be born with empathy. You can develop empathy. You can develop skills to be more empathetic, right? You can develop curiosity towards other, really, other, other races and ethnicities, and um, you can develop an idea of respect where you don't think that your culture is better than another person's culture. These are things that are teachable, right? Believe it or not, they are. You don't have to come in kindergarten with, with these people. We can, we can reinforce them. The second thing they wanted to learn was, just, and this is very appropriate to the story you gave about the monk, was pain management. You know, they talked about, uh, the residents and students talked about how pain management, it seems to be different for different people. And what you were talking about, Ron, with the reinforcement of stereotypes, you know, this is where those reinforcement stere stereotypes come through. There's a study at the University of South Carolina, I'm sure many people, you're shaking your head, where they showed that minority patients, medical students thought minority patients need less pain meds because black patients have thicker skin. This is what they thought. I'm not making this up. Study published, right? You, you heard about this, right? So, so, you know, people wanted to know about pain management. They also wanted to know about obtaining informed consent. So, you know, what surgery means in different cultures, how do you navigate that? They wanted to know about that. And the fourth one I thought was very, very important. They wanted to know how to work with patients who had limited English proficiency. How do you work with an interpreter? You know, we really don't really train anybody how do you work with an interpreter and how does it actually, you know, that you're supposed to talk directly to the patient and not to the interpreter. And I mean, people don't know these basic concepts we never teach them. So those are the four things, Monica, that came up uh, that, that the folks want to learn about. And I think the key is to, in developing any curriculum, is to ask people, you know, these are smart adults, you know, what they need, and then create a program that addresses that. Thank you. My name is Diego Molina. And thank you. It, it seems that your research is really focused on determining this metric for health uh, disparities. And I'm just curious, does, does this metric exist in other countries? Like, have other nations and their health systems done research on this topic? And have you gone into contact with those research groups? So thank you for asking that question. Um, and I usually don't say thank you. But I'm going to say that because this is, at this moment, I feel proud to be an American. Because no, most countries do not. 
some countries it's banned to even talk about this stuff. Once we had a uh, visiting professor from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh uh, in Ireland, right? And I asked him about healthcare disparities. I said, so you have 8% um, folks from Northern Africa. Do you have healthcare disparities? And the president of the Royal College of Surgeons says to me, no, no, no. Those folks are undocumented immigrants and are not part of the health system, so they do not have any disparities. <laughs> That's what he said, right? That's what he said. And so, you know, we have come a long way. We've come a long, long way. And I think by having discussions like we're having today, right, where we can live in a society where it's okay to have a discussion like this, where we can bring folks together and have differences of opinion. Some people, you know, will say have one opinion, other people have others. But we can talk about them and then come up with solutions. Uh, and I think that we have the greatest chance to really create an equal society. We are, uh, at least of the countries that I've visited, I have never seen any place more equal than we are. And we just need to keep on making it better. And better. I'm Elizabeth Paulson. I'm in the Department of Anesthesia, a resident. Um, so in relation to what you were just talking about, about um, sort of, and I think also relating back to Dr. Ravalala's story, I think we often perceive other people's cultures as a barrier to providing care for them. But I know there's been some pretty interesting interventions, certainly in the primary care world, um, about how to um, use the strengths of community and other features that are prominent in other cultures to improve care outcomes by capitalizing on sort of the differences rather than um, trying to sort of work around them, um, particularly sort of like certainly things like pain. Um, and I'm sort of wondering what you think about what we in the surgical world can learn from that. Yeah, I, 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 I hope everybody heard the question. The idea is, how do you capitalize on um, the strengths from other cultures that may be a little bit different than yours? And here's where this whole concept of the American ideal that, you know, we're this idea of the melting pot, right? That, you know, that's evolving, right? That it was a melting pot and everybody's gonna melt and become exactly the same to now more of a concept of like a salad bowl uh, where, you know, everybody has still retains their distinct identity, but together it makes a beautiful uh, harmon it's very harmonious together uh, and can achieve great things. And that's where I, I think that we can build more if we treat every culture with this concept of curiosity and respect. That we don't assume that the way I want to do it in my melting pot, the way I've seen my uh, colleagues do it, is the only and right way. But the way you talked about with the monk, that you know, if you do a certain thing, maybe you will do much, use much less pain meds. You just have to take the time. And so what we need our leaders to figure out is that how are we gonna build a system? What kind of uh, uh, systemic things are we gonna in, inculcate where this culture of respect, which certainly takes longer time, right? Because you have to get to know the patient, learn the patient, do what you were talking about, sit at the, stand at the foot of the bed and understand what's happening. It takes five more minutes. How are we gonna build that five more minutes in the uh, kind of care that we provide. And I'll give you one example of this, one great example of this. Breast surgery. You know, it used to be that if somebody had a breast lump, it would be a very, very short consult, right? Now you ask any breast surgeon, uh, male or female, they would never book a consult less than 45 minutes an hour for the initial consult. Because it used to be, oh, it's just a breast lump and you take it out and whatever, right? Uh, it's an easy surgery. But now we realize how big a deal this is and why you need to spend more time patient, discussing the uh, options with the patient and really doing shared decision making. And that culture has changed over the last decade. And that's just an example of the success that you can achieve if you, if you s seek to do it. We can have more of a two-way discussion. This wasn't supposed to be just me talking, so. <laughs> Because you just brought it up, could you talk a little bit about gender differences? And, and is there a study, again, I'm new to this particular area, is there a study around gender differences in terms of healthcare and disparities? Right. So um, it turns out that, uh, so the question is about gender differences. And it turns out that 
if you want to get, in, get severely injured and lose a lot of blood, it's better to be a woman. Women have, uh, are shown to have much more improved outcomes after severe trauma, trauma hemorrhagic shock compared to men. So there are some physiologic differences uh, which enable women to suffer this better than men. And if you ask my wife, she'll tell me that women do better than men, and I completely agree with her all the time anyway. Um, but uh, as far as gender differences in uh, racial disparities go, uh, we know that minority women end up suffering probably the most from racial disparities. Uh, but has the work evolved enough to really understand all the issues pertaining to that? Um, no, I don't think we've, we've really gotten there to understand. I mean, the, the cardiac medicine. You want to give the mic? One. No, I was just going to say, I mean, there's, there, I think there's a good number of examples. Heart literature is, is probably the best developed. It, that females have MIs unrecognized, right. their, their aggressiveness in treating hypertension, incidence of strokes, is all significantly higher in females. And so I think it's an extension of the same, same concerns we've been discussing. Like you have a white male come to the emergency department with some chest pain, you immediately think heart attack. You have a minority female with same symptoms exactly come to the ER, emergency department, you're like, oh, she's just having stress, she's having a bad day. Clearly those many issues pertaining, pertaining to that and it's something that needs to be studied. So lots of students in the rooms, gender disparities and racial disparities is a, is a great PhD topic. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up, yeah. Hi, um, so uh, I go to Hopkins in Baltimore and one of the recurring subjects that comes up, whether we're talking about undergrad life or uh, future career options or just medicine in general is community engagement. Because one of the things that I, that never struck me, but after going to college there for two years, is there was a persistent fear of the medical college at Hopkins among many of the um, African-American youth of the city for many decades. And it has been only recently that, like, or I mean, recently that Hopkins has been actively trying to enforce this community outreach um, in order to, you know, make people realize that, you know, it's a good thing also. Um, so I guess my question is, in regards to racial health disparities, I think one of the most important things is trust also. So what, how would you advise to improve the trust between um, hospital institutions which may be seen as authoritative or outside versus these um, vulnerable populations? So here's where at least the trauma folks, uh, the doctors specifically, need to learn from the experts because the surgeons are certainly not the experts. The experts are here in the school of social work. They're in the school of you know, the Institute of Translational Health Sciences. They're, they're folks who can help figure out what's going on in the community and help create a much better engagement. And one example, and you bring up Hopkins, um, you know, they had a, uh, you know, issue here with healthcare disparities and uh, this fear that some of the medical students had of the community. And so what they started to do is, is that they started to do a one-week healthcare disparities intercession. And they started to do this about six or seven years ago in which they would have the students come in a week early and ex do a community service learning project in the community to get to know what Baltimore really is like. So that you understand that all this stuff you see on TV and all these things that you saw on the wire, what they actually mean. And you understand that if, if, if you have a patient and you're trying to counsel them on uh, diet modification and they happen to be from the inner city and they happen to be black, the reason why they don't listen to your diet modification is not because they don't want to listen to you like your suburban white patients are. It's because there's nowhere to buy the green leafy vegetables you're telling them to eat. And there's nowhere to go exercise, right? Uh, so by doing those service learning projects, they, people begin to understand that. And then now it's become like a mandatory part of the introduction and people really, really rate it very highly. So that's just an example. So if you go to med school there, um, that's an example of, of, uh, of, of how you can do community engagement process. And I know many other schools um, at Harvard Medical School, we have a very similar program uh, that, we, that we do that works in certain ways uh, that have done uh, uh, things that will engage the community. I want to get to your question. Um, thank you. I just I want to complicate things a little because yeah. uh, I think what I've noticed is that frequently racial disparity gets simplified into black, white, Hispanic. 
and there there's a lot more uh, to sort of multiculturalism than that, especially um, thinking about sort of the model minority myths. Um, so is there work going on that is addressing sort of not only the big three, but also everyone else who sort of gets, gets lumped into the, the other category? Yeah. I think the way to combat the model minority myth that you so elegantly speak about is to uh, not look at patients, and it's not easy to do this, but not look at patients specifically as a minority, but as a specific person who may be very different than the stereotype that we have created in our minds. And the way to do that is by talking to the patient and spending time to learn what their independent values and, and, and things that are important to them are. I'll give you an example, not even minority, but sometimes for breast reconstruction, if it's an older woman, people don't even offer it. Because they're like, why would she care? Turns out, a lot of people care. And so um, it's just a matter of taking time and building structures where you know now it's a multidisciplinary clinic and everybody gets a consult from a breast reconstruction person, no matter how old they are. And so that kind of can take that away. I know you gave me the one minute warning there, so I'll, I know I'm long-winded, so I'll <laughs> quiet. Thank you very, very much.